anyway, uh, there we go. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to Stroh's Brewing Story. Uh, my name is Samantha with the Northville District Library. And tonight we have Jeremy Dimmick with the Detroit Historical Society. I do wanna give a, a shout out to our friends of the library who is sponsoring this event. So thank you so much uh, for doing that. And I'm gonna hand it right over to Jeremy and he'll take it away. All right, thanks Samantha. Um, yeah, thank you for having me and good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about uh, Stroh Brewing Company. Hopefully some stuff um, you may not know already. Actually, I'm gonna take a minute here and share my screen if you'll bear with me for just a moment. Um, so we can have some things to look at as we talk here too. Um, so that should be on the screen. That way you don't have to look at me the entire time. You can uh, have something else to look at. So there we go. Um, just get that going. So yeah, um, normally uh, when we do these programs, we say hello from Detroit, but I guess, um, you know, there's, uh, everyone is everywhere. So <laughs> hello, everybody. Um, at the Detroit Historical Society, we're actually uh, continually celebrating our 100th year. Uh, the Historical Society was uh, founded in 1921 at what they called a meeting of congenial spirits at the Detroit Public Library. Uh, at that meeting, they actually decided to have another meeting uh, where they uh, actually founded the, the society. So it sounds you know very familiar to today. We meet uh, to say we have a meeting. But it was at that very first meeting in 1921 that they decided um, that they needed to have a three-dimensional artifact collection somewhere in the city to represent the city's history. There was already the Burton Historical Collection at the brand new public library, uh, but that was focused on paper and archival documents. Um, and they had all of this three-dimensional stuff that they didn't quite know what to do with. Uh, so enter the Detroit Historical Society. Uh, if you haven't been to our museums, uh, lately, or or if you've never been, I wanted to take a real quick minute here at the beginning to tell you a little bit about our organization. Uh, so here you're looking at the Detroit Historical Museum. It's at 5401 Woodward Avenue uh, in Midtown Detroit, right across the street from the Detroit, the Detroit Institute of Art. Um, this museum opened in 1951 on the city's 250th birthday. And that collection that we started building in 1921 um, was put on display in this building for everybody to come see and enjoy. Ten years later, we actually opened the Dawson Great Lakes Museum out on Belle Isle. So this museum is dedicated to Great Lakes maritime history, uh, which was a thing that was not, that was covered, but maybe not covered as good as it should have been at the main museum in Midtown. Uh, both of these museums are still opening, or, or st are still open rather, still holding public hours. Um, the Dawson this time of year is open Friday through Sunday. This is a peek inside the Detroit Historical Museum in Midtown. It was completely renovated in 2012. Um, and if you've been to the museum since 2012, it'll actually look different even in these photos. We installed 19 new exhibits over the calendar year of 2023. So if you haven't been lately, it's one of those things where you really haven't been. Um, particularly if you're interested in beer, and if you're on this call, I'm guessing you're at, at least somewhat interested in beer. Uh, we also have, down on our lower level, a beer exhibit. Uh, it's an exhibit called Detroit's Brewing Heritage, and it's one of the newest. It opened actually in 2022, but has been so popular it's been extended a couple of times. Um, it's about the history of Detroit beer dating back to uh, native people really up through the local craft beer scene, uh, including a certain company that's really the focus of our time today. So, okay, uh, with that, you know about the museums, you know about me, the commercial's over, we can get into it. Uh, so there's lots of good histories of the Stroh Brewing Company out there. Um, so why is this one worth your time? And really, uh, I think this one's worth your time because it's uh, access to stuff. Um, the material history from the company um, that had until very recently, like February of 2022 recently, was in the Stroh Brewery Corporate Collection. And while this was, uh, the material was really well cared for, it definitely wasn't accessible to the public. Uh, 
Um, and of course, this you know dovetails nicely into what we do. We take historical material and we make it available to the public. Uh, also, this is a Detroit story worth telling. Um, the Historical Society's mission is actually to tell Detroit stories and why they matter. Uh, Stroh's is really one of these iconic Detroit companies. Uh, if you, you know, tick off Detroit, uh, iconic Detroit companies on your fingers, you might think of the car companies or the sports teams or Fago or Verner's um, or something like that. Uh, but Stroh's is uh, certainly one of those companies that actually loomed so large, kind of figuratively and literally, that uh, even the route of Interstate 75 when it was constructed had to detour around it, as you see in this photo on your screen now, I-75 coming right toward the Stroh Brewery and then taking a little bend uh, right around the way there. When 75 came through, it cleared out neighborhoods kind of famously. It, they demolished churches, but it went around Stroh Brewery. Uh, also, it's interesting that big companies generally don't care about their own history, um, and they tend not to care about it because it can't really do anything for them. Uh, most businesses are focused on future profits, the future, the future, the next quarter, the next year. Uh, but Stroh's was different. They were family owned and operated for 150 years, and they kind of always paid attention to their own history. And often they drew on it as a, as a marketing tool. So while they were publicly really proud of their heritage, more importantly, kind of behind the scenes, they were also carefully filing items away for posterity. Um, and I'll bring up a, a quick housekeeping note here. 98% of what you're gonna see on your screen comes directly from the Stroh Brewery collection that uh, the Historical Society re recently collected. Um, I'll make note of it when it isn't from the Stroh collection, but when in doubt, this is something that came to uh, the DHS from the Stroh collection. So, of course, uh, Detroit beer and Stroh's specifically didn't just come out of nowhere, come out of a vacuum. It was formed as kind of this uh, long, uh, long obsession, I guess you could say, with beer, uh, the human race's long obsession with beer, I'll say. So we'll give a very quick background uh, as to how we got to what we're talking about today. So beer itself is uh, about 6,000 years old. Um, and some, some of the earliest uh, cuneiform tablets, so some of the, our earliest written records are actually already keeping track of beer sales. Um, and of course, it wasn't the kind of beer that you crack a can and pour out today, but it was beer in the sense that it was made from these four key ingredients. So water, grain, yeast, and hops. Uh, the Mayflower, for example, carried beer across the Atlantic Ocean. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson both had breweries on their estate. But in what would become the city of Detroit, our beer story really starts in 1706. And it starts that year uh, because the man, the myth, the legend, Antoine de la Moth Cadillac, who's pictured on the left of your screen here, invited a gentleman named Joseph Parent uh, and his family to move to Detroit. Parent, um, who coincidentally had a creek named after him, Parent Creek, uh, that got renamed Bloody Run um, after the, uh, the Pontiac's Rebellion, um, was a... Uh, Joseph Parent was what they called a mechanic, quote unquote, which in those days meant he could make and fix things. People like Joseph Parent are extremely important to these frontier settlements. I mean, Detroit in the 1700s, particularly in the early 1700s, was on the edge of the map. Um, if you sent a letter from Detroit back to France, you might get a response in three years three years. They're literally literally on the edge uh, of the map. And so you need these jack of all trades type of people um, to get by. The reason Parent's important to our local beer story is because he was in charge of producing along with his other duties, what they called a small beer, um, which was a weak lager really for soldiers and the residents inside Fort Pontchartrain. Uh, but the beer wasn't for fun. Uh, people inside the fort knew that the best way to avoid, avoid uh, waterborne diseases like uh, dysentery or cholera was to add a couple of drops of alcohol or run the water through some kind of fermentation process to kill off whatever might be swimming around in there. So even though parents' small beer was mostly for business and not really for pleasure, if you drank enough of it, it could, you know, kind of keep a party going. 
And there's a uh, Fort Pontchartrain there, or at least a, a a rendering of Fort Pontchartrain sloping down to the Detroit River in the bottom right hand corner. There. So with that in mind, we'll fast forward to 1853. Uh, and here you see Detroit in 1853 on your screen. It's a city of about 20,000 people. And the city of 20,000 had 17 breweries. And if you do the math, that works out to one brewery for about every 1,200 people, um, which seems like a lot. But at this point, beer production was done on a very, very small scale by modern standards. And individual brewers' territories, if you could even call them that, were measured in blocks, um, which is how the city could support that many brewers at once. Um, these were generally storefront operations as opposed to you know, modern, large industrial breweries like we'll see um, in a couple minutes here. At this point in history, in 1853, the person who is brewing the beer really dictates what they are brewing. And what I mean by that is people from the British Isles, well, they tend to drink ales and porters and stouts. Uh, Germans tend to like pilsners and lagers, and so that's what they brew. But because of a growing number of uh, German people coming to Detroit in the 1840s and 50s, it created this natural demand for German style beers. And these are the companies that eventually grow to dominate the Detroit beer market into the 20th century. So I'm talking about brands like Goebel and Schmidt, and Mann and Voigt. These are all beers that get started in the 1840s and the 1850s in Detroit. And brewer, uh, I'm sorry, German brewers become so popular, their brand of beer, their style of beer, pilsners and lagers become synonymous with beer itself. Uh, of course, Stroh is one of those German brewers. At the bottom left of the screen here, you'll see Bernard Stroh. He came to Detroit in 1850. And according to the company legend, he was actually on his way to Chicago from Pennsylvania by boat when the boat stopped in Detroit to take on fuel and he came ashore to stretch his legs and he liked it and so he stayed. Uh, Stroh brought with him a family brewing tradition that dated back to the 1700s from Kern, Germany. And he sets up a small brewing operation on Catherine Street uh, at the corner of Hastings in 1850. And if you see S1 on your screen, that's where this first location was in Detroit. You can see, if you can see my cursor, here's Grand Circus Park, Campus Marshes, the Detroit River to kind of orient you where you are in town. And uh, here's Gratiot going out to the east side. This whole area east of downtown and south of Gratiot, highlighted by the yellow box there, was a large German enclave. It covers parts of what's now Greektown and what used to be Black Bottom. Um, and something really interesting about this part of town that isn't necessarily related to the Stroh story is that this is always an immigrant neighborhood. Um, so it was it was German really early on. It was Jewish after that um, and became, um, you know, Black Bottom and Paradise Valley, the famous black enclaves um, in the early to mid 20th century. But out of this small location, Stroh did pretty well for himself delivering barrels of draft beer by wheelbarrow until he could make enough money to justify buying a horse and wagon to take his beer around town. So after a decade of brewing on Catherine Street at that S1 location, he knew a bigger place would be required to make more money, essentially. So he purchased property on Gratiot between Hastings and Rivard Street, and that's marked by S2 on the map there. Uh, the second location is actually within sight of the first location. He starts building there in 1864, and it takes three years to finish, finish the brewery. They start brewing there in 1867. So the name on the front of the building they build, which is on the right-hand side there, uh, initially said Brewery of B. Stroh. And uh, if it's worded like that, then that means... This image dates between 1867 when the building was completed and 1875 when it was renamed the Lion Brewery. Um, it was a Italianate style brewery with these two huge 12 foot long lions carved by Julius Melchers, a fairly well-known uh, Detroit artist at the time, perched on the corner of the buildings uh, here and you can see the other one here. Uh, lions, of course, are a uh, feature very prominently into Stroh marketing, and they also happen to be from the municipal crest of Kern, Germany, uh, Stroh's hometown. 
So it's pretty neat that some Stroh family history is baked into kind of the symbology related to the company up to this day. Uh, this angle taken looking up Gratiot, um, so downtown would be behind us and uh, East Point would be up the road a little bit. Uh, this angle shows the brewery, of course, and then that home in the foreground is actually the Stroll family home right next to the brewery uh, on Gratiot. So when this brewery was built in the 1870s, Stroh's was growing. They were growing enough to build a big modern facility like that, but they weren't even close to being the dominant brewer in town. Um, by sales volume, they were actually fourth uh, behind Goebel, behind Kling, and behind the leading producer, Voigt. Uh, but Stroh was on the rise. And if you look at this rendering, uh, again, the brewery on Gratiot there, you'll see the wording on the front has changed slightly. Now it says Bistro Brewing Company as opposed to Brewery of Bistro. So that means that this drawing was made sometime between 1885 and 1902 when they changed the name again. Um, but this image actually brings up uh, the first 3D object out of the Stro collection that I wanted to talk about. Um, and I hazard to say it because I, I'll probably say this a couple times throughout the presentation, but it's one of my favorite, if not my favorite artifact um, that we received out of the 2,500 or so that we took on from the Stro Brewery. Um, and I'll bring up a picture of it here. It's actually a keystone arch, um, a keystone from one of the arches rather in this Lion Brewery. Um, so at one point, you can just barely make it out. It said Bistro across the top. There's kind of a design here in the middle. And then 1864, which was, of course, the year construction started on this brewery. Um, we don't know which archway it came out of. If you look at these 10 windows across the front and uh, the front door here, we, we're not exactly sure where that came from. Um, but of course, it stands to reason that if you're going to make a keystone, you want to make sure people see it if it has some decoration on it. So it's probably over one of the more prominent windows, either the one over the door or maybe the one in the center of the building. Um, but this object has a, a fantastic story that I'll get into, get into a bit here. Um, so by 1935, the original Lion Brewery, uh, Brewery of Bistro, Bistro Brewing Company, whatever you want to call it, this Italianate building right here on the face of Gratiot, or fronting on Gratiot. Uh, by 1935, this building had looked like this. It was turned into this. And we know it's the same building because you see those 10 arches across the front, the door on the right there. And you can actually see the new modern Stroh Brewery that we'll talk about in a little bit um, behind it there, just behind Gratiot. Um, Stroh at this point was using the old Lion Brewery as a storehouse. They had torn it down to one story and were using it as a as a storage facility. Again, we don't know exactly where that keystone came from. Maybe if we had a higher res photo, we could zoom in and find out exactly where. Uh, but the search continues, at least for that. So in 1936, uh, Stroh decided they were going to tear down the rest of the old line brewery. So this last floor that was left of the old place, they were going to tear it down to build a modern stock house on the same, um, on the same site. So that modern stock house built in 1936 looks like this. Um, and it stayed there uh, until this building was demolished in 1986. But when the old Lion Brewery was demolished in the 30s, uh, the demolition crew salvaged the keystone out of one of those arches and decided to install it in the wall of the new stock house. So the keystone stayed in the new stock house until it was demolished in 1986 when it was salvaged again and then added to the Stroh corporate collection and then subsequently to the DHS collection. You can see it up close in this next photo here. Um, you can see these are a couple of executives. Uh, Gratiot, to orient you a bit, would be out to the right hand uh, of the screen. You're looking north here at the stockhouse. And it was actually embedded right in the wall of that new stockhouse, original Keystone, 1864, Stroh Brewery Company, 1935. Um, and we'll enlarge it so you can see it. And you can tell over the years it's weathered quite a bit from when this photo was taken. You know, the letters are actually visible. 1864 is actually visible. But how cool that, you know, this piece of the collection, you can actually track the entire history using the rest of the collection to create some context around why the heck uh, 
it's in the condition it's in and kind of the journey it's been on over the last 170 years or so. But anyway, a diversion, back to our story. So by the 1890s, Stroh were shipping beer as far as New England, and they're really ramping up their marketing to expand their reach. One of the ways they did this was by creating exhibits at uh, World's Fairs and um, kind of these international competitions. Um, and they, they set up an exhibit at one of the most famous World Fairs in history, the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Um, the Stroh collection actually includes a handful of really fascinating objects from this 1893 World's Fair. Uh, first and foremost is this bottle that you see on your screen here. Uh, it's from the 18, it's from 1893, uh, 1894, and it's interesting for a few reasons. The first being uh, the bottle label. Uh, the label itself stands out because it's rectangular, as opposed to the oval label that they would really come to be known for, and you'll see a lot of other times in this presentation. Another reason it's noteworthy is this special label above the main label, the blue one that reads, Highest Award and Medal, World's Fair 1893. Um, and of course, if you know anything about uh, beer or familiar with beer, uh, you know that 1893 at the Chicago World's Fair was also where Pabst won their famous Blue Ribbon, spawning the name Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer. Um, so what gives? Well, we, we didn't know. Uh, Google gave no help. So we uh, we dug into the files. And uh, according to the Stroh Company files, there was plenty. Uh, one executive um, was writing a letter back to Detroit. And he writes, quote, uh, there were plenty of medals to go around, end quote. So basically, if you had a beer at the 1893 World's Fair, you would win a ribbon, a blue ribbon for it. It was essentially a participation medal. Um, but either way, Stroh's kept theirs, and there's a picture of it there with Christopher Columbus on the front. And we even have an image in the collection of what their exhibit looked like. You can see here it's made completely out of Stroh kegs at the bottom and Stroh bottles of beer. Um, actually, if you visited this exhibit at the 1893 World's Fair, they would give you a souvenir mug that you could take home with you. And there was literally hundreds of thousands of these things around. Um, and so they were kind of treated like the ephemera they were meant to be. They were thrown out. If they were broken, they weren't put back together. And so these things have become somewhat of a collector's item, even though there was hundreds of thousands of them around being given out for free in the 1890s. Um, it's a really cool piece to have, and we were all very excited to see it when we came across it. But uh, I've been talking for a while, so I'm going to uh, step aside and we'll uh, take a commercial break here. Just one second. I'd sure like another Stroh. Oh, wait. Alex? <laughs> Two cold Strohs. <laughs> Where do you see this? Just open the refrigerator. Just open one bottle. Just open the other. Now he's pouring yours. Now he's pouring mine. Alex, you better be drinking your water. <laughs> Strohs and Stroh Light for great taste and good times. So that's uh, one of one of four commercials I'll show you uh, over the course of the presentation here. Uh, in addition to all the three-dimensional objects that we've been talking about, all of this archival material that's on display, we also uh, accepted a huge collection of film and, and tape artifacts that contains all of their uh, um, TV and radio ads and are in the process of digitizing those as well. So. I grabbed a few. They're all really fun. And um, boy, the jingles all get stuck in your head, too. Um, but anyway, before the break, we were talking about Stroh's getting better and better at promoting themselves. And aside from these World's Fairs, they also sponsored baseball teams, marching bands, really at, like anything to get their name out there. And they had gotten so good at promoting themselves but that by 1902, they were the largest brewery in Detroit. And they were making about 300,000 barrels of beer a year. They were undoubtedly helped by the fact that Detroit's population during this period was booming. Uh, between 1840 and 1930, so 1840 to 1930, the Detroit population doubled every decade. And by 1910, a full 20% of the city's 500,000 people came directly from countries that had an affinity for beer. 
So you think of Germany, you think of the British Isles, chief among them. Uh, company president Julius Stroh, who was Bernard's son, knew the increased demand would eventually outpace the old Lion Brewery. Uh, it would outpace their ability to meet the new demand. So he sent a gentleman named Otto Rosenbusch, who's coming up on your screen now. He was the Stroh brewmaster. He sent Rosenbusch on a European tour to learn all the new uh, tips and tricks and trends and uh, learn about the equipment that was behind kind of Europe's best beer products. So when Rosenbusch was touring a brewery in Bohemia, he actually observed a brewing process that involved a small copper kettle that was heated by direct flame uh, from a fire. And this is a really outmoded, old-fashioned method by the 1890s, turn of the 20th century. All but kind of the most rinky-dink brewers had long abandoned brewing with a direct flame uh, in favor of steam. Uh, because steam gave you more control and it was uh, more economical to do so. Uh, but Rosenbusch loved the fire brewed taste and he convinced Stroh that direct flame made a superior beer and they could make it work on a much bigger scale in America. So based on this recommendation, uh, Stroh's hired a German company to make and install six giant copper kettles to be heated by direct fire in a brand new eight-story brew house pretty near the old one. Uh, the collection actually includes the original drawings uh, for Stroh's famous fire brew kettles. Uh, so these are from 1912, and they're actually in their original German. Um, so this is kind of ground zero for America's only fire brewed beer, the actual blueprint, the plan that was approved by the Stroh family uh, to construct the brewery. So fire brewing would be something, of course, Stroh Marketing would lean on for the rest of the company's existence. Uh, to set them apart from the rest of their competition in Detroit and really around the country. So while they employed an old brewing technique, uh, the Stroh brew house was state-of-the-art for 1912. Uh, here it is with the shorter administrative building to its left. And then I, as I briefly mentioned, these buildings were actually on Elizabeth Street, which was one street north of Gratiot. I'll pull up a map here. So uh, you can see if you need to. So this blue X shows the new building. Um, and of course, you see right here, Stroh's Lion Brewery fronting on Grashit uh, right in front of it. The first floor brewer hall um, was uh, really a showpiece worthy of the number one brewer in town, which Stroh's was uh, by this point in 1912. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of it here. Um, so I mentioned the big copper kettles, German engineered copper kettles. Um, everything was trimmed in this green and brown poabic tile. The entire brew house was trimmed in this green and brown poabic tile. Um, if you look closely, you can see that on these tray ceilings, there's actually hop vines that are hand painted on the ceiling all over this massive um, brew house. Um, here is a picture of this ornate stained glass window with the Stroh Lion Crest uh, that kind of oversaw the entire brewing operation. That was part of the collection as well, and that color picture is how it appears today. In putting together the Stroh corporate collection, even after the building was demolished, they had the foresight to collect these uh, brown and green kind of iridescent poabic tiles. This is an image of the brewery from the 1970s that gives you a sense of the colors um so they saved a lot of tile they saved the doors off of those giant copper kettles which are now in the dhs collection as well so stroh's in 1912 had made a huge investment in this new brewing facility um and they it was such a big undertaking they didn't actually start to brew beer there for about two more years so 1914. Uh, 1914, of course, is just in time for Michigan Prohibition in 1917, two years before full national prohibition. So while other Detroit brewers shut down, uh, just closed their doors, uh, ceased operation rather than deal with everything prohibition brought with it, because Stroh's had made this huge investment in the new brew house, they really had no choice but to stay open. And they thought they were going to be okay, actually, right up until the legislation passed. Beer brewers thought they were going to be exempt. Um, but feeling kind of the winds of change and knowing prohibition in some form or another was coming, 
long before 1917, Strohs really began to position beer as a temperance drink, so an alternative to hard liquor. So while temperance often gets confused with prohibition, true temperance was basically, you know, what we call moderation these days. Uh, beer makers thought that a four to five percent alcohol beer was the perfect alternative to I don't know, chugging a bottle of whiskey, for example. Um, so in this photo, you'll notice on the bottle uh, on the right, the Stroh's label, that new oval label, label actually says, quote, for family use. Um, they would actually deliver this beer to your home. So then dad wouldn't have to spend his evenings at the saloon and uh, contribute to the breakdown of society. Um, a lot of pilgrim and Puritan uh, marketing popped up around this time, too, to show how wholesome beer was uh, in comparison with hard liquor. So when the Volstead Act uh, was actually passed in 1919 that uh, you know, kind of codified national prohibition, it only allowed a 0.5% alcohol beer. So Stroh, who decided to stay open, had to pivot and really pivot fast. So they survived by doing a number of different things. Um, they stopped brewing Stroh's Bohemian beer, and they started brewing Stroh's Bohemian lager. That's on your screen here. Uh, beer was not uh, legal, but lager was legal, a small but important difference. Uh, and they brewed it, this lager, at the 0.5% that was allowable by law. Um, so the brewing process to brew this near beer was pretty much the same as pre-prohibition. But at the end of the brewing process, they ran the beer through what they called a de-alcoholizer uh, prior to bottling. And so de-alcoholizing it, uh, say that five times fast, uh, brought them into compliance with the new law, but it also heated up the finished beer to boil off the excess alcohol. So it left the beer with this really scorched taste um, that was ter terrible, and it was darn near unpalatable. Um, but because of this, uh, they started printing their bottles with the instructions to be served ice cold, that quote, serve ice cold, um, they, they meant literally. So at 32 or even 29 degrees, because serving it cold would mask the taste. Where serving it at the regular 45 or 50 degrees uh, would make the beer taste terrible. So that's you know something that seems like a gimmick in modern beer advertising, um, but something that had a very functional purpose during Prohibition was to mask the terrible taste of this near beer. So uh, after they started bearing, brewing this near beer, they renamed themselves the Stroh Products Company, and they began making a bunch of different stuff to try and muddle through. Prohibition. Uh, the most famous one, and one that's still around today, is Stroh's ice cream. Uh, it started out as Stroh's Alaska ice cream, and it was so successful that after Prohibition was repealed, they kept it on as part of the business. Of course, you could still go to the grocery store and buy Stroh's ice cream uh, today. In addition to the near beer and the ice cream, they started making soft drinks. They made a drink called Caledonia Dry Ginger Ale. They made a drink called Old Gold Ginger Ale. They made this Mate Cola, uh, orange soda. They made club soda. Um, but my favorite Prohibition era product by far uh, has to be this, Stroh's Malt Syrup. Uh, and so malt syrup is basically unfermented brewery wort. It's essentially the liquid that represents the, the first step of brewing. Um, and so this malt syrup was nominally sold to be used for baking. Uh, and there's recipes printed right on the can that called for one ounce or two ounce per dozen of cookies. Um, but everybody knew uh, what was being done with this stuff because you didn't sell a gallon. This is, uh, you know, the size of a paint can. You didn't sell a gallon of malt syrup to be used for baking. Everybody knew it was used uh, to brew your own beer. So, well, of course, selling beer is illegal during Prohibition. Home brewing was not. You could buy your own ingredients and you could make your own beer at home, but selling, you know, homemade or selling homebrew kits with everything you'd need um, in one place was illegal. So Stroh's told this line by printing a warning on your cans that I'll on their cans that I'll pull up now. And it says, quote, not to be used for making an alcoholic or intoxicating beverage, uh, which is is hilarious. <laughs> The Stroh's even went as far as to sell a hop-flavored malt syrup, which, you know, really makes you think, gee, I wonder what a hop-flavored malt syrup was actually being used for. Um, Stroh's wasn't the only brewer doing this and really towing this line. 
you know, saying, hey, we we make a legal product. Anybody can buy it. And what they do with it is is their problem, not our problem. Um, but actually, Budweiser went as far as to make this display uh, for grocery stores, uh, which is Budweiser malt with the grocery clerk literally winking at you, uh, which is a great piece. So as the only outfit brewing near beer in Detroit, Stroh's had is a distinct advantage uh, over the other beer companies when prohibition repeal finally came. All they had to do was essentially reroute the flow from the de-alcoholizer to the bottling plant, and they were off and running. So actually, while other brewers were just starting to ramp up production after repeal, Stroh's received a special dis dispensation uh, the night before repeal actually was made official and provided an American Legion fundraiser with 60,000 12-ounce bottles of Stroh's Bohemian, um, which, if you're familiar with the city of Detroit, 60,000 12-ounce bottles would reach from Orchestra Hall in Midtown all the way down Woodward to the Detroit River. Um, this image on your screen now is from that party with Julius Stroh, who's the mustachioed uh, gentleman there, pouring the first beer to Frederick Alger, who is a, a local leader, at least, of the repeal movement. Um, but with that, it might be time for another commercial break. So here's one more. Son, huh? Son, I've been meaning to have a little talk with you, huh? Will you turn that thing down? What do you want to talk about, Pop? Well, look, you're not a kid anymore, you know what I mean, huh? Oh, please, Pop. Oh, come on, son. I can still remember the day my father walked in just like oh, this. Oh, no, Pop. All right, all right, I'm going to be straightforward. When you go out with your uh, friends, do you ever drink beer? Pop, Come please. On, son, be honest with me. Do you drink beer? Of course I drink beer, Pop. I'm 29 years old. Okay, okay. I just want to know that you're drinking good beer. I drink good beer. That's what you say. Oh. If I knew you were drinking Stroh's, I'd know you were drinking good beer. What do you think? You're the only one in the world who knows what good beer is? Well, it just so happens. Pop, son. Pop, listen to me. I drink Stroh's. Honest. Son, your mother and I, we only want what's best for you. Oh. But back to our story again. So even with uh, prohibition repealed, Stroh's really wasn't out of the woods yet. So just as the beer supply was recovering from prohibition, there were grain shortages, grain shortages rather, uh, related to the Dust Bowl and um, grain rationing because of World War II. And so this shortage and the rationing really forced brewers to a crossroad. They could either weaken their beer to make their grain go further, or they could just make less full strength beer. Uh, and Stroh's decided to keep the kind of taste the same and just make less of it. And so while the move really preserved their reputation in this period and in the immediate post-war period, it actually became a liability later on. And it became a liability because beer drinkers had gotten used to a lighter tasting, less flavorful beer. So by the 1950s, people hadn't had, you know, quote unquote, real beer in almost 30 years. So the fact that Stroh's was essentially still serving the same beer from 1917 meant that it had a much heavier, much more bitter taste by comparison. So uh, you can see these changing consumer tastes in Stroh's post-World War II annual barrel sale, annual barrel sales numbers, rather. Um, so they sold 900,000 barrels in 1947, and that fell to about 400,000 barrels by 1950. So it was a fairly steep decline over a fairly short period of time. And you can see this global advertisement, um, you know, calls out that fact that it's mellowized. Have you tried it really? So Stroh's for the first time in about 80 years was in third place behind Pfeiffer and Goebel, who coincidentally both shut down during prohibition. So Stroh's determined it was easier to change the taste of their beer than change consumer tastes. Um, they made the beer lighter and they debuted this on the nose, but uh, effective marketing campaign. You'll like Stroh's, it's lighter uh, in 1951. It didn't take long for them to get back on top actually. And they were uh, by the mid to late 1950s, by 1956, they were uh, selling 2.7 million barrels of beer, which is a record high for them. And uh, 
times were good for a while until spring 58, when a strike actually shut down beer production for 45 days. Um, and while it was damaging, again, in the short term, historians point to this strike in 1958 as the time when national beers were able to really gain a foothold in the Detroit market. So while you could always get Budweiser and Pabst and Miller in Detroit, the national brands didn't have the success they had other places because the Detroit breweries were so strong. But after this strike, uh, all Detroit brewers' production was way down for almost a decade into the mid-1960s. Uh, Strohs would, of course, recover. But Goebel, their brewing neighbor across Gratiot, you can see the Stroh Brewery here on Gratiot, and uh, Goebel right across the street was headed in the opposite direction. And Strohs actually acquires Goebel in 1964. The acquisition was uh, smart for Strohs and relatively low stakes. It was also just the start of this industry arms race uh, in which Strohs would have to make larger and larger financial gambles um, to stay afloat. We'll skip forward a bit here uh, into the 1970s. So heading into the 70s, Stroh was in very good financial shape and set production records uh, really throughout the decade. So in 1970, they made 3 million barrels. In 1972, they made 4 million barrels, 5 million by 75, 6 million by 1976. But that was about as far as they could go as a regional brewer in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, a bit of Illinois. Um, they knew they couldn't create more beer buyers. They simply had to increase their sales among current buyers. So at first, they tried to do this with new products. Um, and the newest beer product in the late 1970s was diet beer, or what became known as light beer. Of course, Miller paves the way with a light beer in 1975. Other, other smaller breweries had tried it, but uh, Miller Light in 1975 was really the first successful light beer. Uh, interesting to know that when Miller debuted light beer, they were the fifth largest brewer in the country. Um, and just a few years later, they shot up to number two. Stroh's was a little late to the light beer party, um, rolling out Stroh's Light in 1979. And this advertisement from the Free Press uh, explains why, uh, and I'll read to you part of it here. Quote, it says, as near as we can tell, the Stroh family has been brewing beer since 1775. And with all due modesty, we think we've made quite the name for ourselves with a regular beer. So the logical question is, why are we putting all that on the line for the dubious distinction of being the last major brewer in the country to come out with a light beer? It's simple. We found a way to make light beer good enough to bear our name. We call it Stroh Light, end quote. But unfortunately, Stroh Light never really caught on, not like Miller Light did anyway, or later uh, Bud Light, uh, which didn't come out until 1982. So with Stroh Light not necessarily the hit they hoped for in 1982, they had had some initial success with another new beer called Stroh's Signature. And uh, this was a beer that was an entrant into what they called the super premium category. So it's the top of the line. It was the most expensive. They rolled out Stroh's Signature kind of in the same way that uh, GM had Cadillac at the top, uh, Chevrolet at the bottom, and Oldsmobile kind of in the middle. Um, Stroh Signature was their Cadillac, Goebel was their Chevrolet, and regular Stroh's was their middle-of-the-road Oldsmobile Buick. Um, but Stroh Signature came with, uh, in these special bottles with gold foil at the top, um, they rolled out this kind of quasi-most interesting man-in-the-world uh, type ad campaign. This guy with the sweater and the beard on your screen now was uh, scuba diving, he was jumping off cliffs, uh, he was flying airplanes, he was doing all kinds of stuff. But um, the rise of import beer in the 1980s more or less kills this domestic super premium category, the segment of the market, before it could be of any real help. Um, and into the 1980s, with Anheuser-Busch and Miller chipping away at the remaining regional brewers' customer base, Stroh knew it couldn't keep on like everything was fine. They tried to grow kind of organically with these new products, Stroh Light and Stroh Signature, with lackluster results. So now um, they'd have to try a different tact and they tried growth by acquisition. Stroh went uh, initially after New York storied Schaefer beer brand in 1981. Uh, the acquisition gave Stroh's Schaefer's distribution network in the Northeast, but more importantly, it also gave them 
uh, Schaefer's relatively new Allentown, Pennsylvania brewery, which is shown in the lower right hand corner there. Um, and I uh, wanted to include a picture of it because it's different from the Detroit brewery, kind of the flagship brewery, in every single way. It's suburban, it's sprawling, there's room to grow all the way around it, there's access to freeways, access to rail, uh, and everything, all the equipment is relatively new. At the time of this merger, Stroh was the seventh largest brewery by sales in the country. But to give an idea of how far back they were, you can see Anheuser-Busch at the top of the list selling 50 million barrels a year to Stroh's 7 million barrels a year. Um, so adding Schaefer's uh, three and a half, four million barrels a year didn't even get Stroh's into sixth place nationally. So what did they do? They expanded again. Their next move was to acquire the even larger Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, the beer that made Milwaukee famous in 1982, uh, then the fourth largest brewer in the country. So this acquisition vaulted Stroh's from a distant seventh into third, uh, striking distance of Miller and Bud. Uh, the Wall Street Journal called this acquisition, quote, a goldfish swallowing a whale because of Stroh's relatively small size to Schlitz's relatively large size. After the Schlitz deal, uh, firebrew kettles were actually installed at the Los Angeles and Allentown breweries. And this is important because the move essentially spells the beginning and the end for Stroh's in Detroit. And we'll talk more about that in a second. This deal ends a crazy couple of years from the company. Uh, in 1980, there were one brewery shop that could produce 7 million barrels a year. They had three brands, regular Stroh's, Stroh Light, Stroh Signature, and they basically served a, a regional market centered on Michigan and kind of the upper Midwest. Two years later, in 1982, they were a seven brewery operation that could produce 22 million barrels a year with 18 brands serving a national market. A huge transformation in just two years, 24 months, essentially. So with the benefit of hindsight, we see that Stroh's really peaked in 1985. They made 24 million barrels of beer in 1985, which was an all-time high for them. And unfortunately, they'd never reached that, that high again. They also had some fantastic marketing in the 1980s. And uh, one of those I'll show you is uh, the commercial coming up next. And just fair warning, this song will be stuck in your head the rest of the night. Refreshing, less filling. Now you're talking strolls. Now you're talking beer. Now you're talking good times. And strolls is spoken here. I love that one because those guys do it all. It's presumably after work on Friday and they, they get pizza, they go bowling, they go to a boxing match. It's like <laughs> they're out all night running around. I love that commercial. Um, but after 1985, after that peak we, we talked about just a second ago, uh, the decline was fairly rapid. Stroh's had about $500 million worth of debt from the Schlitz deal, and that debt came at a very inopportune time. Um, so sales across the beer industry were pretty flat with no real increases on the horizon. They're also facing really tough competition in just about every segment of the market that we talked about a second ago. So um, some hard decisions had to be made. Soon they realized they didn't need all seven of their breweries, and you can probably see where this is going. The flag flagship Detroit brewery was their most expensive plant, and since they could now fire brew beer in L.A. and in Allentown, the Detroit brewery was basically a luxury they couldn't afford. It was a, it was a dinosaur by the 1980s, um, and by this period, the large urban brewery like the one we saw in Allentown uh, or of the, I'm sorry, the one, the large urban brewery, like the Detroit one, was kind of a relic uh, from a time when proximity to your customers was a necessity, and it just wasn't anymore. Um, so Stroh chairman Peter Stroh said on the closing of the Detroit plant in the Free Press, quote, I want to emphasize strongly that our need to close the plant is not a uh, need to close the plant in Detroit is not a Detroit problem, a union problem, a power problem, a workers' compensation problem, or a utilities problem. 
It's just a problem of a plant that is very, very old, geographically constricted and no longer competitive with the modern facilities which so dominate our industry today. So the last working day at the Detroit plant was May 31st, 1985, and the complex was demolished that next spring. This is a photo of that stockhouse you know, built on the original Lion Brewers site, falling onto Gresham Avenue with uh, downtown Detroit in the background there. So even with the Detroit plant closed, Stroh's wasn't done yet. Uh, they changed their look again in 1989, uh, going blue for regular Strohs and silver for Strohs Light. Um, that same year, it looked like Strohs was going to be bought out by Coors, but the deal fell through in the 11th hour. So they were left in this situation where they were going to have to sink or swim basically on their own. They made one final gamble, uh, and that was to acquire Heilman Brewing and its cadre of brands in 1996. Uh, the acquisition was considered to be a good fit at the time. Heilemann was number four and was actually Stroh's closest competitor. And the approach of uh, the acquisition also gave Stroh's a foothold in the Northwest, where Heilemann brands like Rainier and uh, Blitz Weinhard were really popular. And this presence in the Northwest actually gave them a jumping off point to ship beers overseas, uh, which was one place the beer market was actually growing. But uh, ultimately, the competition in the mid to late 90s was, was too fierce. There was a long price war between the top two brands that made this Heilemann acquisition you know, increasingly unprofitable. So basically, the debt Strohs took on to get Heilemann uh, eventually sunk the ship. So Strohs was sold to Paps and Miller in April 1999, uh, just one, sh one year shy of the company's 150th birthday. Um, so what killed Strohs? Kind of left with that question, 150 years of history boils down to, you know, uh, what happened? Uh, it's easy to say it was mismanagement or one big critical error, but uh, beer historians, which is uh, a pretty cool job if you can get it, um, say it was economies of scale, basically, and changing consumer tastes. So much more uh, kind of mundane everyday things that eventually brought the company down. Um, historically, brewers had expanded by two methods. They expanded organically or by acquisition. Budweiser, uh, for instance, for an example, grew organically by building new plants in desired territories and then putting Budweiser up against everything else already for sale in that region. Um, Strohs grew by acquisition. They purchased factories, they purchased distribution networks, and in theory, they purchased the customer loyalty that came with buying those brands. But instead of replacing Schaefer and Schlitz and Old Style with Strohs, they kept brewing all of those brands. So by 1999, they were brewing close to 30 different beers. And in short, brewing 30 different beers is expensive, uh, basically. And it's uh, less expensive to brew fewer beers like Anheuser-Busch was doing. They basically made Budweiser, Buzz Bud Light, uh, Bush beer, and a handful of others. It's way cheaper. Um, and you're it, interestingly in the fight to go national, all of these large brewers changed the taste of their beer, trying to make it as palatable to the greatest possible amount of people. And the end result was that Bud Light, Miller Light, Stroh's Light were nearly interchangeable taste wise. Um, and so, sure, people were sad when Stroh stopped brewing in the city. But, but I. Ironically, because their beer now tasted so much like everything else, uh, people were quick to find alternatives. So in striving to appeal to more people, Strohs and a lot of other companies abandoned the thing that set them apart in the first place. This homogenous taste, you know, among these macro breweries is what sets the stage for this craft beer revolution in the 90s and 2000s. It was like everything tasted so similar that people were just hungry or thirsty, uh, more specifically for uh, different tasting beer. So if this uh, presentation has made you thirsty, believe it or not, you can still go out to your local grocery store and buy Strohs. Paps never discontinued the brand. They just kind of pulled way back on its marketing after that 1999 acquisition. And in 2016, Paps teamed up with this outfit called Brew Detroit, who is a, con uh, a contract brewer in Corktown to create uh, Strohs Detroit Lager. 
which was supposedly crafted from the original recipe. So for the first time uh, since 1986, Stroh's was actually brewed in Detroit, um, but it isn't anymore, unfortunately. Um, so ironically, well, before it was owned by a Detroit company and brewed elsewhere, now it's, uh, or at least then in 2016, it was brewed in Detroit, but owned by an outside company. Um, and you can you can still get it. Um, it of course says Stroh's Stroh's beer, uh, you know, a, a division of the Paps brand on the can. They uh, you know use that uh, kind of '90s blue marketing uh, currently, but it, it's at least on the shelf uh, at Meyer and other and uh, other places. Though it can be hard to find. Uh, so here's one last commercial to kind of take us out here From to the end of our time. Well, I said just do it again <laughs> before I lose it. You can't top a good thing when it's made the right way. That's why smooth and mellow strokes is still vibrant today. From one beloved to another strokes. From one beloved to another strokes. How does sensation look? Another one that'll get stuck in your head. But if uh, you want more on this topic, I would highly recommend uh, a couple sources of information. One is this podcast called Untold Detroit Beer. Um, it's a podcast by the Detroit Historical Society, but I don't recommend it because of that. I recommend it because it's a, a genuinely good podcast. Um, it doesn't focus specifically on Stroh's, but focuses on Detroit beer brands throughout history. Uh, you can listen right through our website or you can download it, you know, wherever you find podcasts. But either way, it's a very interesting listen. And um, again, I'm not just saying that because it's from DHS. Uh, uh, it's a genuinely good podcast with interesting interviews with interesting people who uh, know a lot and have a lot to say on the subject. I would also highly recommend two books that I'll bring up here. The first is called Brewed in Detroit, Breweries and Beers Since 1830 by Peter Bloom. Uh, Peter Bloom was the Stroh cor corporate archivist, um, and before that, he was the guy who came up with the recipes for Stroh's Light and Stroh's Signature. So obviously a very knowledgeable guy uh, and a very interesting read on top of that. The second is a little more modern. The only problem with Bloom's book is it was written uh, before Stroh's uh, was sold to Pabst. So um, the second is a little more modern. It's uh, Detroit Beer, A History of Brewing in the Motor City by Steve Johnson, which is also very good and a lot more current. Uh, so with that, uh, we're we're out of time. And uh, thank you for your attention. Hope you enjoyed yourself this evening. I'm happy to hang on if uh, anybody has questions about something I might have mentioned or uh, or uh, what. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen now. And um, thanks again. Let's try and figure this thank out. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself, I suppose. Hi, this is um, Suzanne again. You mentioned the strike in 1958. Um, what was that about? Yeah, it was actually um, the, the Beer Distributors Union um, went on strike. Uh, and the, the why that happened is uh, still kind of nebulous. We're still trying to figure that out uh, ourselves. But um, the one thing that that popped up as you as you start looking into it is, you know, I mentioned the national brands kind of getting a foothold um, during that 45 day strike, I believe it was. But um, advertising wise, they really, really went after it. You see um, full page ads, full page Budweiser ads in the Detroit Free Press, you know, which was something and, you know, going back and looking through the newspaper, they they just didn't do. Um, you see full full page ads for Miller. Um, so they're really trying to take advantage of that strike. But yeah, yeah, the the why of uh, how that strike happened and kind of the finer points of negotiation there are still uh, still trying to figure it out. Questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Gambling and brewing beer in Detroit, didn't that have go hand in hand when they closed down? You oh, didn't sure. work on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, wasn't um, there an ordinance that you couldn't brew beer in Detroit and have gambling 
Am I yeah, not? You know, that I'm I'm not 100% sure on, actually. I mean, I know, you know, during Prohibition, there's the old thing, uh, there's a quote by the police chief that said, you know, uh, you couldn't find a drink in Detroit unless you uh, walked 15 feet in any direction. And then, you know, you could you could find anything you wanted to drink. But yeah, um, you know, gambling, at, at least, uh, yeah, it has has been illegal at least for for you know quite some time. So the the intersection of those two illegal activities, I'm sure went I'm sure went hand in hand. But um, no, I'm not, I'm not uh, 100 sure on that one either. Okay, thank you. Do any of the craft breweries use German uh, style at all? Or yeah, anymore? that's that's a really interesting question at least none that i know of are using that specific kind of fire brewing technique that that stro did there there may be somebody out there now it's it's exploded to such a point where it's like you know anything's possible <laughs> i guess and like how how micro are some of these micro breweries i'm sure there's someone right. out there doing it um but one of the interesting you know uh, connection to the stro story too is that um when they closed the Detroit brewery, a few of those giant copper kettles that I mentioned were actually sold to Bell's Brewery in Kalamazoo. Um, who they're still using Stroh kettles, original 1912 Stroh kettles to brew Bell's beer, which is something oh, really cool. Um, so you're drinking a little bit of Stroh's every time you have a have a two-hearted or, or something like that. That's interesting. Yeah, and I like Bell's too so you know they're light-hearted and they're regular-hearted yeah absolutely <laughs> um nobody else has a question i was going to ask what was that like you were talking about during prohibition how they found ways to lower it but that was quite an industry in detroit when you hear about canada with hiram walker you know bringing uh, you know uh, liquor across the water and all the little speakeasies and and all that you know uh i wonder yeah. if they, they had to like beer still too you know so <laughs> right yeah and you know michigan being in the position it was in it um you know obviously uh geographically advantageous to be you know right across the river from canada but uh michigan going into prohibition and uh 1917, you know, two years before national prohibition, you know, that really started uh, coming up, you know, Dixie Highway from Toledo. Um, so Detroit kind of earned its uh, earned its stripes smuggling beer and liquor up from Ohio before they started bringing it in from Canada. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was quite the operation, especially on the east side, where you know, a lot of people already had boats and um, were already yep. engaged in the process of like souping up those boats to be able to evade um, evade police and that. But yeah, it was it was big big business. That's yeah, interesting. It's fascinating history, and it's still my drink of choice is beer. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeremy, we had one question uh, from Mark: Is Stroh's still fire brewed? Yeah, so and there's some contention about that. Um, when they were brewing at the uh, brew um, the facility in Detroit, kind of the small scale contract brewery in Corktown, um, they said it was fire brewed. It said, you know, from the original fire brewed recipe. I guess um, we'd only know if you were if you were inside. I think I have my suspicion that that's more marketing um, than than fact uh, today. Where is the Powabic tile around the copper kettles? Is that at the historical museum? Or? Yeah, so a lot of it, a lot of it was saved. Um, we uh, there's some of it in the historical museum collection, but there was uh, when we were going through the collection, you know, kind of picking and choosing what we were going to take uh, because we couldn't take everything. Unfortunately, we you know are tasked with telling a lot of stories, not just you know one specific story. Um, Pardon me. And there were, you know, literally pallets full of milk crates full of these tiles, uh, some of which stayed with the gentleman who had the collection. Um, and we took we took one pallet, um, which amounted to something like 20 milk crates full of tiles, um, which was you know, too many. 
really like uh if you think about it what are we going to do with that many tiles but um right yeah so they're they're still out there uh a lot of them of course were lost in the demolition but a good amount mm -hmm. of them are salvaged and and saved so um I don't know. They, they'd, it'd make a heck of a bathroom if uh, they ever came up for auction or something like that. But oh, sure. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of them still out there. And the Holy side. Um, so Suzanne made a comment. There's another good book by local Michigan author called Michigan Beer: A Heady History by Patty F. Smith. Um, and Martha had a question: What happened to the Stroh's mansion? Oh yeah, that was that was right next door. Eventually, it you know they the the family at least moved to Gross Point eventually, um, and so the the mansion was was torn down to be able to expand that uh, that stock and storehouse property along Gratiot. Yeah, which is a shame because you know like a like a lot of places in Detroit, you know, um, what a cool thing to to keep uh, and preserve, and you know uh, we've lost a lot of those buildings unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah, it's too bad. Um, um, Callie said some of the tile is put up as artwork in the Compuware building. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and and kind of another diversion. There was a um, they had a full like kind of recreation of a German beer hall called the Raskeller Room. Um, it was the executive dining room in that um, administrative administrative building that was right next to the brew house that we saw a picture of um in the middle or so of the presentation but that german beer hall you know with paintings on the wall and antler lights and um it was really well done and built in the in the 19 teens it was actually salvaged out of that building before it was torn down and Stroh's relocated to river place river place the old uh park davis headquarters building right on the river and Joseph Campo and Jefferson roughly in that area. Um, and the idea was to reinstall all of that at River Place and, and make a bar restaurant out of that material that just never, never materialized. So a lot of that stuff too actually came to the historical museum. There's been some talk about, um, we don't have food service in our building. Uh, and so there's been some talk of creating some food service space and using that material from this uh, executive dining room that was at the Stroh administrative building um, could be a really cool thing. You know, all all, all any idea it takes is is money, I guess, to pull it off. But uh, yeah, um, <laughs> no, there's no shortage of ideas for that stuff. I'll say that. Yeah, very cool. Does anybody else have a question? All right. Are the Stroh grandchildren living in the area? Or? Yeah, um, there's there's uh, one in particular that we interact with who um, was has uh, been a friend of the museum and helped out with a lot of uh, information and support and uh, that sort of thing. But yeah, they've kind of uh, scattered um, the family itself, but there are still a handful of people in the area. It's still the best beer, the Germans, I think. You know, both of the Canadians. <laughs> so, beer wars. Uh, any they other had, questions? The old tap room had a hundred, what would that have been, 200 anniversary of the prohibition, and they had everybody dressed up in the 19. 30s or whatever when prohibition was you know finally um, prohibit you know uh, brought back yeah uh, and they had pins no beer no work <laughs> you know so it's fun cool. it's fun history yeah it to is look back yeah. on. i Absolutely. don't know if i want to be part of it but i guess blind pigs were a big to do in those days so yeah yeah interesting thank you though Thanks oh my in. pleasure yeah, yeah yeah thank you very much everyone i i appreciate you uh you logging on and hanging out for a while so uh thank you thank you again come see us in detroit sometime okay. yeah we'll definitely have to go check out the uh the you said it was the lower floor yes yep. um, down with the streets of old detroit in that area oh yeah that's pretty cool thank you wonderful thank you so much jeremy
uh, from the Detroit Historical Society. And another thank you for the Friends of the Library for sponsoring this tonight. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Good night. Thanks, Samantha. Thank you.